me say, thank, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank everybody involved with uh, bringing me here. Um, these are two, as you see, you've, you've got two very different kinds of, of papers. And so that's, I think it's good you've gotten two different perspectives on the energy environment um, situation here. Um, and there's no point in trying really to tie the two of them together. But I'm going to try and you uh, follow on Warren Cohen's suggestion we should be doing more history around here. And uh, we'll take a look back at a little bit of, 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 of some of the past and how these things that could pop up in both these papers uh, um, have a little bit of history repeating themselves, I suppose we might say. Now, I'm not going, you know, when you talk, go, start talking about China, people start saying they're going to talk about the Shang Dynasty or something. I'm going just <laughs> with 1950 here. And uh, in the post-1950 period, uh, energy saving and recycling began in China, but largely for, I think, for pragmatic reasons. So that's uh, one thing to keep in mind. Propaganda was seen then in those days as a cheap sort of way to launch environmental uh, issue, issue, issues and, and uh, environmental movements, as was with all kinds of political movements. And um, health issues was one of the things that started very early. Now, um, a, Liz mentioned that health issue is still a crucial issue, so um, we're 40, 50 years on, and it's, this is still one of the first issues that was taken up, still is having problems. Um, the health issues in those days uh, were often concentrated in the, in the major urban areas, and they stayed that way. But gradually, I think over time, you might say that the health issues are moving upstream with the pollution uh, in, in China, at least the, the, the water ones and the air ones as well, moving into the interior with lots of, as factories often have been rectified in China, the old equipment was just sold into the interior. Uh, and moved, so the problem was swept into the interior, so to speak. Um, in the 70s, China began to look at uh, water projects as kind of the first area for, for pollution control, rather than, say, air or solid waste or, or noise, which was the most neglected of all of, the, of, the, of those kinds of pollution. And there were obvious reasons for health uh, implications. Um, again, Liz's paper emphasizes that water remains a major problem and has now a, a, a become a global one. Uh, so here we have a problem that started 40 years ago that still is with us. Uh, climate change, uh, well, oh, I forgot, in the 19th, uh, 1970s, of course, China uh, went to the Rio conference and it led the developed countries, uh, developing countries, in arguing against the, 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 uh, the, the, develop, the, the developed countries as to who was the cause, major cause of, of pollution. And in some of the haggles we see today that are going on the climate change argument, um, ideology behind it has changed, but the, the, the conflict is still there. Um, climate change really only recently, I think, moved to the top of the U.S. and, and the Chinese agenda. And I think uh, one thing, Liz makes this point too, again, to some degree, uh, Japan and also parts of the European Union, particularly Northern Europe, I think have, have a, we're addressing this issue much more seriously much earlier. I'll come back to that a bit later. A timber loss, really, is kind of a big, the last decade and a half has been a kind of a big turnaround. Um, back uh, in the 19, early 1990s, uh, there was a book published by uh, Stanley uh, Richardson of Forest in the People's Republic of China, I believe, in which he was talking about rates of, uh, of deforestation at, and at that time would have depleted several provinces would be empty of trees by uh, today, basically. Uh, that hasn't quite happened. But what has happened, of course, is that the, uh, this, the whole timber problem has shifted from a domestic one into an international one. Uh, as uh, uh, Liz pointed out. As a little aside, uh, and a very small point, uh, this can go different directions. In 2004, 2005, there was an Indonesian uh, Simar Mas group has had a, uh, uh, a subsidiary in China called Asian Pulp and Paper. And uh, the uh, Greenpeace organization uh, took these people on for bad malpractice, eventually getting their word into the Chinese government that this Indonesian company was using bad, bad malpractice for uh, forestry work in Hainan and Yunnan province. So this is, can be sometimes a two-way street, although I wouldn't dare s suggest that uh, Indonesia is as much a, a, a involved in this kind of thing as China is at this particular point in time. Uh, energy consumption itself over the last 15 years has gone from uh, domestic matter to an international matter. Most people, they talked about energy in China, used to just use coal, domestic 
coal figures, domestic oil figures, and to, to determine what was going on in terms of China. That's uh, completely impossible uh, to, to do today. You have pipelines going into Central Asia. The great game, in many ways, has started again in that area. Liz mentioned Africa. Um, and within that, there is some infrastructure building being done by, by China, you know, building railways in Angola and other places in Africa. And um, that has interesting, um, that infrastructure has interesting environmental implications, and it's questionable as to whether they're positive or negative. One big issue that wasn't talked about, and I suppose that's because it's not too global, is the steady drain of soil erosion in China and soil quality. And um, that's just something to, to keep in mind. I think it probably doesn't get much play because it's not too sexy. It isn't, uh, doesn't seem to have too much in the way of, of, of uh, direct health implications, but it's, a, it's been a big uh, cause of poverty in China for a long time. I just keep that in mind. Um, we had some mention about uh, NGOs, and uh, just briefly, uh, oh gosh, five minutes. <laughs> All right, maybe we won't talk much about it, about it, NGOs. Other than to say that it's a very, we can, we can ask questions about this, but they seem to be uh, kind of um, a situation where one might call embedded. The relationship with the government is, is, is a very interesting thing, including a whole group of things that are called gongos, which you may have heard the term of, which is always find highly amusing, which is government organized, non-government organizations. Uh, that, that exists in China. Um, I'm glad David uh, pointed out that he left out the Hong Kong data on one of his, uh, one of his, his, uh, his um, graphs, because this I, I had, had, had me somewhat um, worried. It was about 20% about of, of this survey, 19% of, of the student survey were from Hong Kong. And I was just kind of curious as if, as if that, whether that would have, give some kind of stilt to the kind of view of what Chinese students in the, in the mainland were thinking about these things. But I'm, I'm glad he just left that out. It's interesting to see that um, also that gender comes across as a, uh, as a somewhat, in his arguments, as a somewhat influential, but not a majorly influential factor, because it ties directly in with what An Andrew Nathan was saying yesterday about tr uh, traditional versus democratic values, with about, I think, something some very similar kind of proportion uh, in terms of, of the gender issue. So I, I thought it was very, rather interesting. Um, in the diplomacy section, uh, on, on, on this uh, uh, energy paper, uh, it found it uh, quite worrying that we still have this long-standing animosity towards Japan, which seems to kind of negate uh, efforts at cooperation. Um, also, I find it seemed to me kind of uh, amazing that the USA remains so uh, favorable for cooperation compared to the European Union. But it backs up work I've done on, on Europe and China relations in the past. So China really and, and Europe still seem to be, have their backs to each other and to interact very much through uh, the United States. And I, I think it would be important and, and very helpful for several reasons to include a Europe in any work that is done in this matter in, in China. Uh, the uh, energy security response of the Chinese, I found, I can say, was very Chinese, if you think about what I've just said. Um, used propaganda campaigns was one of the things. Yeah, that's just like the old 1950s. Um, do it ourselves. That's Zili Gengsheng. That's the old uh, rely, uh, self reliance argument that the, the Communist Party used. And technological fix, or Kushia DE, has also been a long standing kind of policy that was in, in use in the 1950s and 60s uh, in, in China. So uh, only really the diversification of oil imports amongst the major ones seems to be a strategy of a more sort of uh, global nature. Uh, and on to the USA. Um, which comes in, fits into the to papers, uh, both papers at the end. And um, despite, despite uh, major differences between the United States and China, uh, including four times, for size being four times the population, actually in terms of, of geographical area, both the United States and, and, and China are almost the same size. And if you were to do some kind of comparison of climate and other, other factors, actually China and the United States are the same latitudes, they actually share a lot that they don't share with Europe. I mean, it's kind of strange telling people on the West Coast because China has no West Coast, and you're thinking, what is he talking about? But in fact, in terms of most of the climatic patterns and things, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, that's comparable there. Um, more so than, say, with Japan or Europe or Australia. It is true that um, neither of these countries is leading in the, I think, in, in energy conservation environmental practice, despite skilled researchers in both countries. And, um, and I think, therefore, that we really have to 
would be very helpful for anything that is organized, includes uh, Japan, which has all been in the environment area the greatest, by far, aid contributor to, to China. A and Germany, for instance, which has also been the second largest aid contributor to China, at least as in, in the overall picture, since about 2000, actually, the Japanese have cut their aid to China uh, severely. But they could help a lot with, uh, with, uh, with uh, this kind of practice, and it could be a really a big mutual benefit to include all those groups in any kind of work that's done to try and tackle this global, what has moved from, a, in the 1950s, a scale of several thousand kilometer problem into being a global one today. Okay, thank you.